So I'll, I'll just do a quick intro here. Hopefully everybody can see a, a little intro slide here. Uh, so we're welcoming Anne to the stage. Anne has been in the tech industry for nearly 25 years as an engineer in the 90s, working on high performance servers, e-commerce in the aughts, and developed, all, developed DevOps and operational technology in the 10s. In between, she's co-founded three startups. This talk takes a look at the simple and pragmatic steps that every developer can take to adopt greener hosting for their applications. Welcome, Anne. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, do you want to put on my first slide, James? Excellent. And great. Is so, the as James said, properly? there we go. I think that is, yes, that's excellent. So, um, as James said, I have been in the tech industry for a very long time, nearly 25 years. And I've spent about half my time as an engineer and about half my time persuading engineers to do things. And this talk, is about both of those things. It's about what you can do as an engineer to be more ethical, to run your applications more sustainably, but also probably more importantly, given the audience here today, what, how you might persuade other people to act slightly more ethically and to, to be more advertent, less inadvertent about the unethical decisions they, that they might be making. So uh, James, do you want to um, move us forward? Excellent. So, Normally, when I give a talk like this, um, there's a big question, because I would normally give this as, say, an ops conference or a DevOps conference, a, a technology conference. Most of the people who are present, I can't guarantee that they will actually care about this stuff. I can't necessarily guarantee that they will care about hosting sustainably. This is a slightly different environment because uh, I am reliably informed by your action as joining a sustainable UX conference that you do actually care about this stuff. But in my talk, what I'm gonna be talking about is how we host sustainably. And this conference is very much aimed at front end folk. Um, and you might not necessarily have that much control over how your servers are hosted. So although I'm gonna give, give you a lot of information about how to host sustainably, it is just as important that I talk about how to persuade people who are not you to do it. Because unless you're one man bands, uh, which some of you will be, but not all of you will be, the likelihood is that you don't necessarily have control over where your servers run, that run your applications. So you're gonna have to persuade other people. So uh, James, can we, could you pass, move us forward? Thank you very much. So the first thing, interestingly, is of course, do you believe in climate change? Which is what this really, this whole conference is about. We believe that we have a, a, an industry that is potentially now or actually negatively impacting climate change and we could do better. Now, interestingly, this is not controversial. When I talk to operations people who are the people you're going to have to persuade about this, they generally these days, everybody believes in climate change. There's not, there's not that, there aren't that many people who don't or that they, um, they're at least worried enough that they would like to do something about it. Um, they're quite often with uh, James, if you move us forward. The, um, thank you very much. Uh, they're quite often with Elon Musk on, on this and um, I would say almost every operations person that I meet is a big fan of Elon. Um, so if Elon does it, then the likelihood is they'll really want to do it too. Um, and what Elon says is that I don't know if it's right or it's wrong, but frankly, I don't like the stakes here. Uh, I don't want to bet that science is wrong and all companies are right when the stakes are so high. So this is a good way to persuade ops folk that actually they should listen to what you're saying and have a think about how they're hosting their service. Now, so it's not that hard to get their attention and to get them feeling like there's something, if they could do something that would be a good thing to do. That's not necessarily the first problem you'll hit. Uh, oh, James, could you uh, move it forward? Thanks. But they don't always see that there's something that they could realistically do about it. They often think, oh, well, you know, this is a huge problem. And what can I do? What, what is an individual, uh, an, an operations person, a DevOps person, a back-end engineer, what could I do to help here? Now, what I'm going to talk about today in this conference is the fact that actually 
there are a very large number of very easy and essentially uncontroversial things that operations people can do to massively reduce their carbon footprint. They just don't know about them. Um, so all we really need to do, well, I say all, one of the things, the first thing that we need to, uh, to do is think about it, realize the situation, realize what power they have, and get them to think about taking some very easy first steps. So James, can you... Uh... Now, the reason why this is important is something that, uh, that Kenneth and James both mentioned, which is that we might be front-end developers and we might not necessarily think about the servers that our applications are running on, but they're running in data centers. Uh, and uh, those data centers are a massive, growing, dirty industry. Um, data centers alone, as the Mozilla Foundation pointed out, as we heard earlier, uh, data centers produce as much greenhouse gas as the entire aviation industry. And it's more worrying than that, although that seems quite worrying. Um, because we're growing much, much faster than the aviation industry is growing. So uh, there are good estimates that data center capacity will increase four or five fold by 2025. That means that if we don't act, we'll have five aviation industries within the next decade. Um, and that isn't ideal. We could really, really do with doing something about that. The good thing, is that there is a great deal we can do. So uh, James, can you move us forward a little bit? Excellent, thank you. Now, the good thing about that, well, there are kind of good things and bad things about the data center industry. It's quite concentrated. There are only a couple of key players. So all we really need to do is put pressure on them to do a better job about using renewable power, using renewable hosting, and again, um, James mentioned Greenpeace and the excellent work they're doing, putting pre, uh, pressure on, um, on the big cloud hosting providers with their Click Clean report. Um, and, but we as users, and we might not be, most of us here today might not be direct users, but we're indirect users. Uh, we only need to go and talk to our operations team and they are direct users. Now, the key players that we need to be concentrating on here are interestingly, the biggest companies in the world. So the four biggest cloud providers, uh, which are AWS, Azure, Google, and Alibaba, are also in the top six companies on the planet by market capitalization. They are the biggest companies in the world. The other two companies, top companies by market cap, are Facebook and Apple. And they're also huge DC uh, data center operators. It's just that they don't happen to hire their servers to us to run our applications on. But what you should take away from this is that data centers and massive international corporations that make a hell of a lot of money are the same. They are the same groups of companies. And they are the people that we need to put pressure on. So, uh, which might seem impossible, but it's not quite as impossible as you might think. James, can you? Uh, uh, they aren't unaware of their role here. They do know, this is one good thing, is that they do know, and these big companies, which are all tech companies, and are filled with people who are not unlike us, um, they recognize that they have a huge role to play. And they also know that they're under no society pressure to do better, unlike the aviation industry, where everybody knows, um, my mum and dad are fully aware of the aviation industry as a, um, as, a, as a giant polluter, a giant source of pollution, and they are more than, well, more than happy to put pressure on them. But ordinary folk, people who are not in the tech se sector, don't necessarily know that data centers exist and have no, no idea how much power they use. Um, as Brad Smith, president of Microsoft, pointed out, across the tech sector, we need to recognize, and we don't even recognize it ourselves, never mind outside of the tech sector, that we'll rank amongst the data centers, will be amongst the biggest users of electrical power on the planet um, by 2025. So, uh, James, do you want to? Thank you very much. Um, there is good news and bad news on this. So the good news is that 
everybody, in terms of hosting servers, where, where servers are running, uh, everyone's moving into the cloud. That is the direction of travel that we're all going in. So all your ops teams, if they're not already running in the cloud, they will be thinking about running in the cloud. And clouds are massively more efficient than on-prem. So when you first go to your ops team and, and, and mention this, they might well say to you, oh, we don't need to worry because clouds are much, much more energy efficient than on-prem. And they're right. The cloud is about 10 times more energy efficient than running servers in your own data centers. And that's because the cloud providers run their data centers very well indeed. They have uh, specialist teams, loads of money to invest in the latest technology, uh, and they've got um, efficiencies of scale and economies of scale. So they do very, very well at this. But we are then into the realms of Jevons paradox. And so if your ops person says, ah, oh, don't worry, we're going to the cloud, everything will be fixed. You need to point out to them that the cloud does not fix the problems. It's lovely, it's great, it will help, but it's so easy to provision resources in the cloud, which is why your ops team want to go there, um, that we use way, way more compute resource when we get there. We don't put as much pressure on uh, our developers to be efficient. We just provision more and more and more infrastructure when we get into the cloud. And that really offsets all the gains that we've made from cloud efficiency. So it is good news that the cloud is more efficient, but it's actually not that good news because we just use more of it. Um, so Jevons paradox, that's called. You might hear that discussed quite a lot. Now there's more good news which is that um, Google and Azure are actually what two of the two two of the four biggest cloud providers, or two of the biggest the four biggest cloud users, uh, Google and Azure are quite sustainable. They're one hundred percent offset. Now we know that there are issues with offset. Offset isn't as good as as uh, running completely renewably, but it's at least a start. Um, now. Facebook and Apple are also in exactly the same position. They're 100% offset. That's fantastic. Google particularly so. They're not only have they achieved their 100% offset um, goal, they are also looking at how they can run without any carbon released into the atmosphere as a result of their operations at all, which is really good. So that's across the whole Google um, product set. So that's excellent. And they are a, cl a cloud provider. Your operations folk could put their machines either on Google or Azure. Unfortunately, though, probably that is not where your operations team are thinking about putting their servers, because AWS is by far the biggest and most popular cloud provider. Um, they are more or less 90% of the cloud market. So the likelihood is that your operations team are thinking about running on AWS if they're not already. And AWS are only 50% offset. Uh, that's considerably worse, obviously, than Google and Azure. The difficulty here is that really, because AWS is so popular, they are the default. In the West, they're, default, they're the default. In the East, Alibaba are the default. And we don't have the faintest idea what their numbers are. They're not publishing them. But we have to assume that they're not great. So the bad news here is that the default hosting options are quite dirty, particularly AWS's biggest region, which is US East, because that's in, in a state of Virginia. Although they're doing some work there, mostly Virginia is quite a coal-powered state. So that, that's a real issue. But it's not, it's not all bad news. As I said, Google is the world's largest corporate buyer of renewable energy. Tech is not utterly a villain in this story. Uh, in 2017, Google purchased 7 billion kilowatt hours of electricity from solar and wind farms that were built specifically for them. So this is not just taking power from um, solar wind farms that already exist. This is actually generating new renewable power into, into local grids. So it's absolutely fantastic. As, as in the tech industry, Google are winning here hands down. They are the most ethical in terms of sustainable servers. Um, if we, uh, James, if we uh, move forward. Now, even AWS, I've, I've slagged off AWS there somewhat, and. Um, that they're a long way behind their competitors. 
but they do have some really good offering. They do have four regions which are sustainable, which are 100% offset. And those regions are Dublin, Frankfurt, Oregon, and Canada. If your operations team are hosting in one of those regions, then all of their servers are offset. But if they're not, they aren't. So it is incredibly important that you try and get your operations team to put their servers there. Now, I'll tell you this, I will let you this know this up front. It's hard to move. So once the operations team have moved and deployed servers into a region, you're probably not going to persuade them to move them into another region because that's actually quite hard. But for new capacity, if they're going to the cloud for the first time or they are expanding with maybe a new offering or a service, it's actually no skin off their nose to put it in one of these other regions, generally speaking, uh, one of these sustainable regions. So it's very, very well worth going and having a conversation with your operations teams about where they host, how they host, and the fact that AWS has sustainable regions that they could easily, that they could host, choose to host in. Because once they go with the default, which is usually US East, they'll probably stay there. We want to avoid that. We want them to move into one of the sustainable regions first and then stay there instead. So that is, uh, that's a, a task for you to go off and have a word with your ops folk and find out where they're hosting and just let them know about the sustainable regions and let them know that um, if they make a decision about new infrastructure in the future, even if they're locked in where they are, they could move to these sustainable regions next time, potentially. James, could you? Uh... Oh, thank you. So uh, a couple of months ago, six months ago, uh, myself and some friends in operations and some ex um, AWS friends set up a petition. Because really, if we want the cloud providers to get better, and that means AWS, mostly that means AWS going more sustainable, uh, getting from 50% to 100%. Now, they've said they want to, but they have got no date associated with it. So we really we need to put a lot of pressure on them to, to try a bit harder here. Uh, and also to move the other, although Google are doing really well, Azure are doing moderately well, uh, we want to put more pressure on them to go faster and to get even further because the stakes are so high. None of us want to see another four or five aviation industries in terms of um, uh, of global of greenhouse gas emissions by 2025. We need to get ahead of that. So me and uh, my operations friends set up the Sustainable Servers by 2024 petition uh, on change.org. So if you only do one thing, and there's absolutely no reason why anybody who's listening at this conference shouldn't sign this petition. We designed this petition, if you go off and Google it, it's on change.org, to be as uncontroversial as is humanly possible. There is nothing at all controversial about signing this petition, but it suggests, what we want to do is to suggest to AWS that we do actually care because engineers do have somewhat of a reputation, not unearned, of being a little bit supine, not necessarily caring about the societal impact of what we're doing. So we need to get a reasonably large number of signatures on this petition. And it's already at 1,300 people, so we're not doing too badly. That's better than I was possibly anticipating when we started. But the more we get, the more notice will be paid. And we do know that notice is being paid to this petition. It is waking people up to the fact that actually we care about this stuff and that we are suddenly starting to pay attention to how data centers are powered. Now, under normal circumstances, if I was doing a very short talk, I would just finish here because this is the end. This is, this is the, the, the key thing that I want you to do, but this is just the start because um, you're going to have to go off and make this argument. This is not a thing that you, and other than, I mean, you can find the petition, that's great, but it would be great if you could also change the behavior within your organization. And the likelihood is that I'm, I'm persuading you, but you're actually probably quite easily persuaded and you don't actually necessarily have the power to make the change. So you're gonna to have to go off 
and to persuade other people. Now, I spend a lot of my time these days talking to operations folk about why they should do this and why they haven't done it. Uh, and it is very interesting. Uh, a lot of the reason why they haven't done it is because they didn't know. They had no idea how much power data centers used, even as people who use data centers every day. Um, and they had no idea that there were quite easy changes that they could make, easy choices that they could make to go sustainable, like hosting in the Google Cloud or Azure or the AWS sustainable regions. But even then, interestingly, it can be quite hard to get people to do what you would like them to do. Even though they believe in it, they know it's quite easy, um, and um, they would quite like to do it in the hearts of hearts, they believe in climate change. Now, one of the arguments that people come back to me sometimes, uh, often, uh, on this is, well, what are ethics anyway? Um, isn't it all a bit subjective? Isn't, isn't it unprofessional of me to bring my ethics, which are a personal standard, to work? Now, this is where the, um, I'm really, really glad that Kenneth, in his excellent talk that I really enjoyed, uh, although he covered um, philosophy very well, I was extremely glad that he didn't, unless he did right at the end when I left to join uh, the presenters meeting. Um, he didn't talk about the trolley problem. I hate the trolley problem. And the reason why I hate the trolley problem is that it is a really excellent example of subjective ethics. No one agrees about whether it's better to save the life of three nuns or a baby or uh, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, no one ever agrees on that. And it tends to define ethics as being subjective and not very professional and a bit wishy-washy. Actually, the ethics that I think we need to be talking about if we want to make action happen at work is the very, very strictly defined ethics that exist. Uh, so for example, uh, duty of care. So you may have come across duty of care. It's a, a very common legal concept in a lot of industries. So any industry that does any construction, the oil and gas industry, the, uh, the car industry, and it is increasingly being applied to the tech industry. Up until now, we've very much avoided duty of care, but it is now being applied to AI, machine learning, and IoT, not unreasonable, not unreasonably. Um, and it is about requiring companies to adhere to a standard of reasonable care while performing acts that could foreseeably harm others. And the stick uh, on this is that you'll get sued, and you get sued for a lot of money. So there is good reason why the oil and gas industry, for example, put a lot of time, energy, care, and throw a lot of money at achieving their duty of care um, responsibilities. So that's one very, very well-defined um, concept of ethics at work. Uh, if you want to see a, very, a, a good example of how you might approach handling duty of care, uh, then have a look at the uh, ACM Code of Ethics, which, uh, it, which describes kind of sets of behavior that anticipate a future in which duty of care will be applied to the work we're doing. And I, I would love to see a future in which we say, well, climate change is harming others. So really, we have a duty of care to people not to unnecessarily damage the environment. So James, um, fast forward again, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, another, if, if duty of care is a bit dry, and you like something a bit more exciting, then there is another really, really good um, definition of ethics out there at the moment, which is the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Now, th these were first defined in uh, for the millennium, and they have been revised since then. They, um, uh, they define an agreed set of good behaviors um, that uh, that, that are really non-controversial, that everyone can agree on, the things like nobody should starve to death. Uh, and they, in, they don't include anything controversial like democracy. Uh, but, they, but they do contain things that you might think would be somewhat controversial, but do not turn out to be controversial, things like climate action and clean and sustainable energy. 
So if anybody is saying, oh, well, ethics are not well defined, point them at the sustainable development goals. That is a world standard for what we think is the right thing to do uh, from humanity's perspective. Um, James, do you want to? Now, I'm going to speed up somewhat. <laughs> so this is well defined. We know what to do. It's easy to do. Just host in sustainable regions. This is nothing controversial. This is nothing that is particularly um, difficult. It's not going to get you fired. Um, even if you go for, with AWS, which is the most standard host, uh, there are still ways of hosting responsibly, host to be hosting sustainably. But not everyone does it. Why not? Partly it's ignorance. Um, partly it's kind of putting things off with uh, what is really what the ethics really mean. But most of it, when it comes down to it, are about two concepts that stop people behaving ethically, which is conformity and obedience. James, do you want to? Uh... So there was some fantastic work done in social psychology in the 60s and the 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s, by a couple of social psychologists called Solomon Ash and Stanley Milgram, um, which validated that 75% of us will conform broadly and 80% 80 of us are obedient. Now, when we, I, we say that, we're actually talking about quite an extreme form of conformity and obedience in that we will do things that we think are absolutely, utterly and completely wrong um, because other people are doing them or because we've been told to do them by someone we consider to be in authority. We will kill innocent people. There's no problem with that. We'll, we'll do that. Every test has suggested that that is just innately part of human nature, that we would do what everybody else is doing and we will do what we're told. And we that will utterly override any ethical considerations. And that is what we need to change. We're not gonna change humans so that they don't conform and they're not obedient. We're never gonna do that. But what we can do is try and change what society sees as um, behaving like everybody else and change what authority figures are saying that we should be doing. So at the moment, it's you can form if you go with the default, which is AWS hosting in unsustainable regions or hosting in your own data centers if you're an older company. And those two options are very, very dirty. So what we need to do is put pressure on talk, talk constantly about how our new expectation is for sustainable hosting, not for unsustainable hosting. It has to be the new normal, because if it isn't, then um, if, if it remains the default, then the 75% conformity and 80% obedience means that people will still host unsustainably. Uh, James, can you... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll zip over this. Uh, Sandy Milgram, who was the um, the chap who did the work into obe uh, on obedience, became extraordinarily depressed about um, how we all behave quite appallingly if we think that we've been told to do so. That that culture doesn't stop us, doesn't really seem to give us any permission to do what we think is right, as opposed to what do what we think we've been told. And this partly goes back to the people feeling that they can't be at the work because it's unprofessional, which is which is an element of obedience. We need to keep reminding people and reminding companies to tell people that it's not obedient to be unethical. It is obedient to be ethical. James, if you uh, can report it, this is all about, if you take one thing away from this, um, as a front-end developer, this is, this is a bit like abstractions. You know, where... Um, you uh, oh, have I lost everything? Yeah, okay. This is um, so it's all about abstractions. If you if you abstract your ethics away, if you if you delegate your ethical decisions to a framework, and that framework might be something like React or um, or Angular, and there we delegate an awful lot of ethical decisions there. We might delegate decisions, we we'll delegate decisions about um, sustainability because actually a lot of those frameworks are quite bloated. Um, we also delegate decisions about accessibility, which are an issue because a lot of those frameworks are not necessarily very accessible. Uh, in the same way, 
when we host on AWS or we host on Alibaba, we are delegating away responsibility for the sustainability of our hosting. And we need to hold those frameworks to account. We can't just go, oh, no, it's no longer our problem. We've given it to somebody else. If we do that, they won't do anything. If we want our delegation to be effective at actually improving the ethics of our systems, then we are going to have to hold the platforms to account for the ethics that we're delegating to them. So uh, for James, um, is our future amoral guns for hire? Actually, oddly enough, that is the natural state of humans. We are going to have to override that if we want to do better. Uh, and it certainly, techies are still humans. We're just exactly the same as everybody else in that respect. We need to override it. We need to think carefully, um, shout loudly that this isn't what we want and make it the new normal to ask for ethical frameworks, whether that's um, React or Angular or AWS. We need them to step up to the plate. So, um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll leave you on the final. James, if you'll step forward to the final sl um, slide, if you have not signed this petition yet, please go and sign this petition. This is, this is literally the minimum amount of um, effort. And try and get your organizations to do it as well. Because if they get the hang of doing really, really tiny things, they might learn, learn to do slightly more challenging things like choosing to host in Dublin region or scary things like that. Um, but thank you very much indeed. And I apologize for the late start. Um, hopefully, I will catch some of you in Slack later on.